Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hi guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I sit down with Claire Flynn Levy, founder of Essentia Analytics, to discuss the behavior of investment managers, how they track it, and how managers can improve their decision making in an attempt to improve their performance. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Claire Flynn Levy. Claire, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. We are going to have a, I think, a very interesting talk with you about manager behavior, how you go about me- measuring manager behavior and success in the things that you guys do at Essential Analytics. Um, you've been doing this for a number of years, uh, looking at the decision-making process of managers and, and, you know, I think measuring that and helping managers probably make better decisions in the future. One of the things that I saw on, I think it was your website or somewhere that, you know, what you what you do is through this measurement process, you create a continuous feedback loop um, that helps them become more successful. And it's similar to the way that professional athletes sort of try to achieve excellence um, in their sport. So this is going to be um, really fun. So appreciate you taking the time um, to be with us. Yeah, great. I look forward to uh, chatting. One of the things um, that stood out to me in your background is early in your career, you were a money manager yourself. Um, so, you know, how did you just talk to us a little bit about the story of your money management experiences and how you got to, you know, found Essential Analytics to begin with? Well, I, I was an unusual sort of kid that knew they wanted to be a fund manager from a really young age. And in retrospect, I think that seems kind of weird, but what can I say? I, I learned about fund managers because I, I grew up somewhere where they, they existed. And from what I could see, they made the world go round. That was my, that was my view as a, as a kid. And I wanted to be one of those. And so I made a beeline um, in that direction, educationally did economics and then went to work on Wall Street. And, and lo and behold, I, I got a job as a trainee fund manager right out of college. Um, in London at Morgan Grenfell Asset Management, as it was then called, but that was a, a subsidiary of Deutsche Asset Management. And this was in the late 90s and, and the sort of um, peak days of balanced pension fund management, you know, pre, pre-quant management. I mean, quant obviously existed in a way, but it was not, not a popular option available to anyone. It was all about active management and primarily equity management. And uh, I, I was in the right place at the right time in that I was a tech specialist who had, you know, first generation of kid to grow up with a computer in their dorm room. And I rocked up in London in 1995, full of, you know, chat about the internet and how it's going to change your life and, and all of that stuff. And that was ignored for a while. And then suddenly, you know, these stocks start moving and the organization realized it had somebody who knew what they were talking about on that front. And so I ended up getting uh, a lot of opportunities uh, put my way, which was amazing. And my my performance as a fund manager, I got you know promoted to be running money quite young and my performance was excellent because I was picking tech stocks and <laughs> the tech stocks were going up. It was the internet bubble. Um, so that was great. And I won all the awards and I got all the, the accolades. And that's because the industry looks at recent performance and says, oh, that's a measure of skill. That person's good. That's a good fund manager. And, you know, who, who was I to disagree with that? I was very prepared to believe that myself. And so um, enjoyed that and, and ended up actually in uh, the early 2000s launching a long short European tech fund to focus entirely on that. And that was just in time for the bubble to burst. So I felt the other side of it, which was, gosh, everything I I know how to do is no longer working. What should I be doing differently? 
you know, I, I wasn't old enough to have an enormous ego or, you know, attachment to my investment process. I was very much up for feedback and trying to understand if I have 24 hours in a day and my, my, my job is to make decisions, you know, some decisions will result in trades and some decisions won't. But at the end of the day, my job is to make decisions. Um, can somebody just tell me which types of decisions I'm actually good at? And I'll spend all my time on those and tell me which kinds of decisions I am, you know, bad at and I will stop doing that. But nobody could tell me that that just wasn't where the technology was at the time. And so I set out to build it. And that's sort of, you know, long story short, I, I founded Essentia 10 years ago uh, in London to help human investors make measurably better decisions. So the measurably part is, is important. It was all about, can you analyze data about my past decision making and show me patterns that are either good, you know, so I can do more of that and market myself as being skilled in that way or bad so I can improve. That's, that's what we do. Very interesting how those early experiences in an investor's career sort of can shape, you know, very, very influential, very formative, but you, you know, you went to the high and then you kind of went to the low. Um, yeah. and the fact that you had you know, uh, what's the word, the introspection to kind of ask yourself, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? You know, a lot of people would just be like, well, I'm always right and I'm never wrong or the, the tech stocks fell, you know what I mean? So you, you yeah. actually looked at it internally yourself, which is very cool. Yeah, and I think, you know, when I look at the, the customer base of Essentia, the, the portfolio managers that we work with, there are over a hundred of them around the world at this point. And they are people like that. They're, we call them continuous improvers and skilled but humble. You know, these are people who are prepared to look inward. And it doesn't mean they believe everything they see. You know, you show even a continuous improver that data that is at odds with what, you know, their view of the world is or what they were expecting to see. And they will question it very deeply and, and give it a good shake. But that's what I'm like too. And so we built the software to be able to do that. Um, and these people, you know, they, they're like the athletes that picked up Moneyball or, you know, take your pick on which type of, of analysis early. And then you have the majority that uh, have to be dragged along on that journey, um, which is starting to happen now. What, what type of data do you look at? I mean, is it, is it mostly hard data? Or is there some soft data in there just in terms of, I'm thinking like hard data, like the actual trades, that obviously someone makes maybe uh, the position sizing. Um, but then there's like the soft data, like, you know, of someone's ability to, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud here. You, you tell me like work with a team or, you know, be willing to admit that, you know, they miss this in, you know, this investment. So what type of things do you guys actually analyze there? Well, it, it's very much hard data. Um, we start with daily holdings data uh, at the minimum, sometimes daily holdings and trades. Um, what we're interested in really is the trades, the trading decisions as like, you know, the, the, the data that you already have that indicates where you've made a decision to change something. Um, and we use then a bunch of market data and reference data about the stocks in question and put all of that together and then use our, our years and years. I mean, at this point, Ascent has been going for 10 years. So we've been working on this for a very long time and, and invested a lot of money in it. And we have a set of um, analytics that, that are based on domain experience, but that are basically saying it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's coming at it from, from a fundamental investor's perspective but applying a quant lens and saying, okay, if we take all of your historical daily holdings and create trades out of that, we can construct what we call a trading episode, which is a sort of zero to zero life of a position in the portfolio. And you could think of an episode as being like a game that an athlete has played, like pick your sport. You could do a bunch of analysis on what do the winning games have in common and what are the losing games have but then we're gonna drill down into the constituent decisions that made up that game 
there's a stock picking decision. That's, you know, obviously an important one. And that's where the, the industry tends to to focus. But there are a lot of other decisions that you make around sizing and timing and, and all of that. Let's zoom in on each type of decision um, from entry timing, scaling in, adding in trimming, scaling out, exit timing. And then we have a couple of, of sizing related ones in addition to that. Um, and let's just see, are there any circumstances in which you tend to add a lot of value through a certain type of decision or destroy a lot of value um, through a certain type of decision? And that's the, that's the starting point. But the, the, the soft characteristics part, the st analysis of, of uh, the soft side is fascinating to me. And it, the only reason that we haven't got into that is that we have yet to find a, a really comprehensive, universally applicable measure to apply. There's so many different you know, personality tests and assessments and everyone's got a different flavor of it. Um, but to do anything really interesting from a data analysis perspective, you need everybody to have taken the same quiz and everybody's, you know, you want to be comparing apples with apples. So, um, yeah, we just haven't found that, that holy grail yet. Are there, when you look at the types of mistakes managers make, I mean, are there certain things that rise to the top across all the people you look at? Like, for instance, one thing people will say a lot is that managers are much better at buying than they are at selling. Like selling yeah. is usually a problem. I mean, is that one or are there other things you see that are common among the managers you look at? Um, so we definitely do see that people tend to be better at buying than than they are at selling. And, you know, they're, that l makes sense logically because people have more experience of buying things in their life than they do selling things. Uh, but the way that it, it manifests in portfolio management is that people have a tendency, not everyone, but some, some people more than others to hold on to losing positions for too long. And that's, you know, classic loss aversion behavior where you, you're hoping that it's going to go up or you feel that it, it's even cheaper now. So, you know, why would I sell it here? Um, that can be a trap. And we do a lot of analysis to look at like, at what point, you know, in that process of holding on to a loser for, for a really long time, would it have made sense historically to just pull the plug um, so that we can then remind them in the future, oh, it's happening again, you know, FYI, you should have a look at this. Um, but the other thing that, that we see, again, it's not everyone, nobody, there's no one thing that all, all people do badly or well, but uh, another common thing is, especially amongst fundamental equity managers, uh, the conventional wisdom is that long-term is is the right answer and that you should hold on to things as long as you can. Um, and sometimes there is such a thing as too long. And so people will manifest the endowment effect, you know, in the behavioral science parlance, it's like the tendency to, to overvalue something by virtue of your own ownership of it. And that looks like holding on to a winner for so long that it, it becomes a round trip and it turns into a loser. And that's a, that's a very value destructive behavior. One of the things you mentioned in your answer to Justin's initial question is you're talking about the idea of strengths versus weaknesses. And, and I'm wondering, this is something I struggle with myself a lot is, should I be spending more time trying to get better at the things I'm really good at? Or should I be spending more time trying to get better at the things I'm really bad at? And I'm wondering if you have any views on that based on your evaluation of managers, how you think about that? Oh, I mean, it's, it's down to a personal preference, but for my money, Avoiding mistakes is the lowest hanging fruit. Um, I think it's nicer to focus on the things that you're good at and, and you know, that's a happier experience. <laughs> you don't have to deal with the things that you're not good at. But fund managers cost themselves so much through either big mistakes or little sort of slow bleed repetitive mistakes that they don't even notice on a single stock basis that they're doing. And if you can see yourself doing that and stop yourself, that's what will make the biggest difference. And are you able to quantify it in, in the report you would give to a manager? Are you able to quantify like how much they're costing themselves? So you could say like, here's the specific mistake you're making. Here's what this is costing you a year. Is, yeah. is that sort of how it works? Yeah. And we can do it by 
decision type, by context, you know, when you have a tendency to uh, exit a position that's been going down amount of time or a position that's been going down that's in this sector or that's experienced this kind of volatility, um, this is how much money you've destroyed historically by doing that. And, and the message there isn't, and therefore that's, you know, def destined to be the case in the future. I mean, we're, we're definitely not coming at this by saying everything that happened in the past is going to happen in the future and therefore, you know, use this as your quant model, but rather saying, look, in the past, this is something that's cost you. And in the future, we want you to pay attention to it. And in the past, it cost you hundred things tend to, to, it's interesting, like, it always comes back to roughly 150 basis points of excess return, no matter what your benchmark is. Sometimes 160, sometimes 140, but that's the amount that we come back to over and over again that is really worth playing for. And if you care about making an extra 150 basis points of, of performance, then, you know, you, this is, it's worth addressing your, your issues. Do you think also, I mean, you mentioned you don't do a lot with soft data, but do you also think about like what's going on if there are external factors going on that could be influencing this? So for example, if, if a manager had a terrible year in 2021, but they were going through a divorce in 2021, like, is that something you'll think about as part of your process of evaluating it? Um, I mean, they generally don't volunteer that information uh, to us, but then again, um, sometimes like part of what we're offering is software and, you know, analytics and part of what we offer on a sort of optional basis is um, a human we call them an insight partner and they are a former fund manager who has sat in the seat and understands the pressures and, and you know the nuance of different strategies and their job is to go through all the analysis and sit down with you and, and talk about it on a very objective basis where their only uh, intention is to help you so if you then say look you know, I've been going through a divorce for the last year. It's like, okay, that would explain why your behavior we can see has changed maybe. Um, or maybe it, maybe your behavior, you know, maybe there, that, there's no indication of that in the data. And that's kind of interesting that you, you know, you've, you've gone through this difficult personal time, but the amount you add in trend, the amount, the value you add through entry timing versus exit timing versus stock picking hasn't changed. Like, okay. Um, I mean, there, I've certainly seen uh, academic research and, and other things that would point to the fact that when people go through divorces, it does not help their performance. Um, but we have actually uh, experimented with certain of our clients with a daily nudge. We, we call it a nudge. It's just like a notification. It's, it's pinging you once a day, either asking you some questions or telling you something. And in the case of of this particular one, it's asking you questions about your physical state, your mental state, your, you know, where you are, are you traveling, that type of thing. And the idea is to capture data about that, that you can then plot against the decisions that are being made and the, the outcome of those decisions. And uh, we have managers who ask, you know, are you hungover today? <laughs> How many drinks did you have last night? You know, these are they're wondering, is this affecting my decision making? And, you know, we haven't done that with a very large number of managers, so I couldn't say conclusively um, what the, you know, whether drinking affects your decision making. But I can tell you for the individuals we've done that work with, yes, it does. <laughs> As you might expect, yeah, people make better decisions when they have not been drinking heavily the night before. That's really cool because that, that's kind of a way to bring in the soft data we talked about and your emotional state and a lot of other things, which I'm sure impacts your decision making, but it's very hard to quantify. So that's kind of a way to quantify that. And then you guys behind the scenes can run, you know, aggregate data and see, see how it impacts people. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that there's nothing quite like seeing yourself in a data mirror to motivate you to do something. You know, you could read a million books about what you should eat or, or how, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But that doesn't mean that you're going to suddenly change to eating healthily or, you know, making good decisions. It's like you need to see yourself in that moment. Oh, yeah, that's where I go wrong right there. Mm. OK, and I can't, that's me. It's not other people. I got to be honest with myself here. That's what, if anything's ever going to motivate you to improve. It's it's that. 
You have a really cool thing on your website. You know, you mentioned earlier, people tend to evaluate managers based on traditional performance. And, and there's a lot of problems with that. Um, you have something called the behavioral alpha benchmark on your website that I thought was really cool. So I'm, that sort of evaluates decision making instead of, you know, raw performance. I'm just wondering if you can explain that, how, how that works. Yeah, I mean, so, so the investment management industry, despite the fine print saying past performance is not predictive of future performance, past performance is all that is really being used as a measure of whether a manager is skilled and doing a good job, right? And it's, it's a problem. You know, the reason that that's all that's used is that that's all that the people doing the analysis have been able to get their hands on. The managers typically are only reporting monthly performance at best. And therefore, that's all you have to work with. So the best you can do is work backwards from the performance figure and try and discern whether you know, that performance came from luck or skill. It's a very noisy, uh, you know, data set that you're working with there and finding, you know, actual skill in that, um, that is consistent is very hard to do. What we do that's different is come at it from the bottom up. We're starting with all of the trades, not the, the outcome and saying, okay, if we look at every single trade this person has done, there are a lot more data points than there are when you're looking at, you know, 12 months of performance. And let's look at, does this person get it right more often than they get it wrong? And, you know, do their decisions result in positive P&L more often than negative P&L? And when they are getting it right, is the average P&L of the winning decisions greater than the average P&L of their losing decisions? You know, so you could get it wrong a lot as long as when you're right, you're super right. <laughs> and when you're wrong, you're only a little bit wrong. Or better yet, get it right more than 50% of the time and be more right when you're right than wrong when you're wrong. And that's really what the behavioral alpha benchmark is looking at. It's taking, you know, our, all of our super granular analysis and bringing it up to a very high level and saying, let's look at all the decisions that each manager has made on a rolling three year basis and evaluate them on hit rate, which is that, you know, do you get it right more than 50% of the time and payoff, which is the average P and L on winners divided by the average P and L on losers. And we're plotting that and then saying, you know, down the middle, there's a line that represents what would be achieved by chance, a 50% hit rate and 100% payoff. So are you to the right of that line? In which case, great, you're shown that you are a skilled decision maker, at least over the last three years. But what we've uh, also found is that, that the quality of somebody's decision making as measured in that way is persistent. And that people's, people who have scored highly on this behavioral alpha score, as we call it, um, over the last three years are more likely to score highly in the next four years than people who didn't score highly in the last three years, which kind of makes sense. Like common sense wise, you're like, oh, well, somebody who took their vitamins over the last three years is more likely to take their vitamins over the next five or four years as, than somebody who didn't take vitamins over the last three years. It's, it's a behavior Thing. So if you're an allocator of capital to managers, it's like hugely helpful to be able to come at it from that direction and say, is this guy or, or woman or whatever, um, are the, is this person a skilled decision maker or have they shown that over the last three years? Because if they have, you know, the probability is that they're, they might get their stock picking right or wrong during any particular period. But all the rest of the stuff that they're doing around it is uh, more likely to be helping than hurting. And that, you know, I'd rather give my money to somebody who has shown that they're a skilled decision maker than somebody who hasn't. Yeah, what's cool is you're, you're seeing persistence in that because, you know, if you looked at just three-year performance on managers and said, do managers that have good three-year performance have performance, good performance in the next three years? The answer is no. So obviously you're, you're measuring the right things here and that there's persistence. Yeah. That's not something I think you would see, you know, if you just looked at performance. On, on no, you, you wouldn't. You definitely wouldn't. The, the, the other valuable thing there is, you know, if imagine you have two fund managers and you're looking at their last three or five year track record and you have one manager that maybe is batting and this would be high probably, or you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a 70 percent win rate. But the other manager has happened to hold, I don't know, Tesla or Amazon as one of his major holdings but has, you know, a 40% win rate. Yeah. So you can see how, you know, investors can be fooled when just looking at the performance because you have a manager over here that's, 
you know, basically maybe he didn't buy Tesla or Amazon, but the win rate is much better. But mm-hmm. this manager over here was lucky, probably, and just was in the was in the right stock. So it's very interesting, like thinking about looking at the trades and what you might be able to uncover and mine from that data. Yeah, exactly. Like that manager who just got really lucky with Amazon or whatever. Um, not only will their win rate not not reflect, you know, skill, but their payoff also probably won't because the the we're looking at an average or actually median. Um, so it's not uh, getting one stock right is it, not going to get you a high behavioral alpha score. It'll it'll move it in the right direction probably, but um, that in and of itself is not going to be. Uh, that's not going to do it for you. And uh, as well, it shouldn't, right? I mean, there is a, uh, nobody's complaining that you got Amazon, right? But at the same time, like, how often do we repeat these lucky chances? Not very often. I'm wondering in aggregate what this data shows you. You know, when people look at performance, they say, all right, over the long term, you know, net of fees, 90% of managers underperform their benchmark. But when you look at it this way, I mean, do you find that most managers through their decisions do add value? Uh, well, so we have a, a, a pool right now at, of 100 odd data points, right? All the managers that we actually work with today, they are a sort of self-selecting group of continuous improver types who are into this. Um, so it's probably not your average manager. That's, that's my hypothesis anyway. Um, and soon we'll be opening it up to a much broader uh, array of portfolios. So it'll be really interesting to see how that comes out. Um, what we find in, in the behavioral alpha benchmark is that in general, whether managers are adding or destroying value through their decision-making over a certain three-year period can change. Like sometimes during some periods they do and some periods they don't. With COVID, for example, so our rolling three-year period uh, that ended in Q1 of 2023, was the first time that we have done it where the, the Q1 2020 um, period wasn't included. So you, so you lost the COVID effect in that sense. And, and you saw a big jump up in the percentage. It was more than 60%, I think, of, of the managers actually did were adding value through their decision making. Um, but they weren't prior to that. So COVID clearly messed with people's decision making. Um, overall, which, you know, not surprising. That was a difficult market. <laughs> it was hard to make decisions at, at the time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but we also find that, that the majority of managers that we analyze or have analyzed um, are adding value through stock picking decisions, but destroying value through sizing decisions. Um, and that's sort of Again, probably sounds about right. You know, if you're a manager, you would probably be like, yeah, I could see how that would be the case. Um, manager sizing decisions are made on all sorts of different bases, but often conviction, you know, and what does that even mean? You know, and who's to say that your conviction is predictive of anything? You know, this is where quant and, and fundamental uh, human uh, Portfolio construction can diverge because a human's putting a lot more subjectivity into sizing a lot of the time than than a quant strategy will be, and usually to to its detriment, you know, to the, the human's detriment. That is. This is sort of a tangent, but I'm wondering what you've learned about providing feedback through this process because I would think we're in an industry with people who have fairly large egos, at least to some degree. Although, again, your your point about self selecting, I mean, you're probably finding people who want to improve, so probably want to hear feedback, but. I'm just wondering if you've learned a lot about how to deliver that feedback in the right way so that it's you know received in the right way. Yeah, I mean, that's been a real process of, of trial and error. And we had the advantage out of the gate that, you know, I was a fund manager myself. And so we, it's not to say that every fund manager is exactly like me, but I at least have a, a certain sensitivity to what it's like to be that person. And therefore, we from day one have never talked in shoulds, you know, we're never telling you here's a rule that you should implement and here's, you know, how to do a better job. We're saying, here's a question to ask yourself the next time you're in this situation that, you know, we're, we're, we're leaving the control in the hands of the manager and the decision they make 
you know, the next time in that they're in that situation is entirely up to them. But our hunch or our, our hypothesis is that if you help somebody, if you show somebody their behavioral patterns and you notify them when it looks like they're about to commit another, you know, the same pattern that they said they wanted to stop doing and just ask them some questions that they said they wanted you to ask them the next time they were in that situation, that they'll make a better decision slightly more often and that that will add up if you do it over time. And that has definitely been the right approach. Um, telling fund managers what to do is completely a losing battle. And that's where sometimes quants can, can struggle because they're like, but the math says this. Yeah, <laughs> I know it does, but that, that's, the, that's in some ways the easy part. Getting through to the human to change, the, to acknowledge what you're saying and actually be motivated to do something about it and then do that thing that behavioral change piece is, is the really hard part. And it requires, uh, you know, continuous improvement on our part to like continuously check, are they engaging with this? Are they getting better? What, how, what should we be tweaking? Should we change how we talk about this? Should we use different terms with different types of people? Um, you know, going back to the, the question about soft characteristics, We've done a lot of work trying to understand the differences between different um, types of, of manager that we come across. And it's not type by strategy or, or nationality or age or anything like that. It's like a personality and worldview type. And it's, you know, it's a little bit wooly, but the point is like some people get very turned off by certain terms. If you say, this is groundbreaking, this is, you know, amazing some people are like don't even talk to me anymore i don't want to know but yeah i don't believe you basically other people want to hear like a very common sense uh explanation for things and some people they don't want to hear anything they want to talk <laughs> and so trying to help that type of person is a different proposition to uh trying to help somebody who is prepared to to listen so that's where our humans have to, um, you know, tweak the way that they're presenting the data insights to the manager so that the manager is prepared to actually listen to them. And you have to keep in, in mind that the manager does not have hours and hours to sit there and go through this. You know, at best, you've got 90 minutes once a quarter. So, you know, you got to get that information across very, very succinctly. And it's complicated stuff. Um, so it's always a challenge. But, but the, the key is, and we have learned this the hard way, we don't force this on anybody who doesn't want it. There's just no point. They're, they're not going to accept it. And when you're a, a software company, you, know, you need people to renew their subscription. That's the business model. You want them to want to work with you because they're getting value out of, out of the uh, engagement. And people who say, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, their boss told them that we all, we're all doing this and they're not going to say no if the boss is telling them to do it. But that does not mean that they're going to engage with it. And if they don't, then they're not going to renew. And from our perspective, that's just a waste of time. Can you talk about how the feedback process works? I mean, you, you mentioned there's a human element to it. I mean, is there also like a, a you know, real time sort of data element? So for instance, if I tend to hold my losers too much, are you downloading my portfolio every day and saying, listen, you've got this loser in here. You should probably be looking at it. Am I like getting something on my screen to tell me that? Is that sort of how it works? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we call a decision point nudge. And it would be based on a, a back test where we look at every stock that you've ever held that has experienced a drawdown, you know, of a certain size and you can flex, you know, how big of a drawdown relative, um, and you can flex relative to what, um, Every time a stock has been in that situation, what would have happened if I had exited it on that, the first week that, that it showed that? What would have happened if I had exited after two weeks in a row of being in that drawdown state, not recovering, you know, at least 30% of, of the drawdown, um, three weeks in a row, four weeks in a row, and so on. And then we find, so where is there a statistically significant uh, result that says, after 23 weeks of, you know, being in the drawdown state, historically, 
you would have been a lot better off selling at that point. Um, so in the future, we're not saying, therefore, you now have a, you know, a stop loss that's going to kick in at week 23 of drawdown. But we are going to send you a nudge, an email once a week, and it's going to show you which stocks you're currently holding that are in that 23 week, you know, situation. And we're going to ask you to click on it. And it's going to ask you three questions. And you can decide what the questions are, but they might be things like, would you be a buyer of this stock today? You know, like basic things that you really need to ask yourself. And you might say, yes, I would be a buyer of this stock today. Great, then buy it. You know, or no, but I'm not going to sell it. Okay, don't sell it. But the point is you asked yourself this. And it goes to this whole, you know, and thinking fast and slow. Um, the Daniel Kahneman uh, book, it, you know, he talks about a system one brain and a system two brain. The system one brain is the sort of passive autopilot brain and the system two brain is the critical thinking, you know, deliberate decision making brain. And what we're trying to do is show you here's a point historically where you haven't necessarily gone into system two thinking and really applied an extra level of scrutiny. And that's all we're asking you to do. And we think that in the future, if that's what if you do apply that extra level of scrutiny, you might not always make the right decision, but you're going to make a, a good decision slightly more often. And that that will ultimately add up. Do you mostly work with discretionary managers versus quant managers? Yes, uh, that that is the case. Although there's no good reason for for not working with quant managers. You know, it's sort of quant managers often are interested in what we do, and we'll, we'll show it to them, and then they'll say, "Oh, well, yeah, I guess we could do that ourselves." Like they're smart enough to do it. the The math is is not the issue but it is a question of is that how you want to use your time like if somebody else could do that do you like do you get your own car ex inspected no you take it to an independent third party you let them inspect it and they give you the feedback on what what's working and what's not working and if the answer is yeah i knew that and that's on purpose like fine but you might find some things that you weren't really aware of because you never really looked at it from this perspective before um so it's a matter of time, I suspect, but we, uh, we focused on fundamental managers, uh, you know, discretionary managers for the time being. Yeah, and I think what you, what you talked about with quant managers would be true with me. I think it's true of a lot of quant managers. We think because we have a systematic process and because we have data, you know, over the long term, like we can't make mistakes. And, you know, that you, that, as you do this over the course of your career, you learn that's not true. I mean, yeah. we can still have systematic things we're doing wrong on a regular basis, even though it's data driven and even though we're not making human decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll have questions, you know, particularly in cases where you override a model, you know, different quant managers come in all shapes and sizes. Right. And some are like super systematic and some are like eh, some, you know, there's there's some quant and there's some human. And all along that spectrum, you have humans who are overriding the system at certain points, rightly or wrongly. And the question is like, OK, so when we do override is that helping or is that hurting or how often are we right? And is it only in certain circumstances that we should be allowing ourselves to override? And these are questions worth asking. Do you have, I'm just wondering, having looked at both quant and discretionary managers, I guess it's been mostly discretionary managers, but do you have any views on the pros and cons of each approach? Like what, what discretionary managers might do better than quant managers and what quant managers might do better than discretionary managers? I mean, I think the, uh, the, re the, the research is inconclusive in terms of, you know, is one better than the other? It depends on the market environment and it depends on, you know, a lot of different things. But um, quant managers are clearly better at, at following their process, right? Because they don't have to do it. The computer is doing it. So they're much more disciplined and they should be much more consistent uh, for that reason and discretionary manager. Um, some are extremely disciplined and many are not. Um, so, you know, the guarantee if you're allocating money to the manager, the guarantee that they're going to do exactly what they told you that they're going to do is not as clear for the discretionary manager as it is for the, the quant manager. The quant manager really struggles with the narrative um, often. 
And whereas the discretionary manager is very good at narrative, they can explain what they do and why you should believe that this is going to outperform. And rightly or wrongly, the human brain wants narrative and the allocator of capital is a human who wants narrative. And so the discretionary manager tends to have an easier time winning over the, the allocator with the, the narrative about what's going to happen in the future than the quant manager um, does. And that, I think that's just a challenge for the, for the quant population to uh, overcome. You know, we can't expect people to stop caring about narrative because it's just how our brains work. Um, so there's that. Um, and I think also a human, uh, human manager making discretionary decisions is not limited by just the data sets that they're processing in their model. You know, they, they will have data points or, or patterns or whatever that they remember from the past or that they've come across, you know, connecting dots between effectively between data sets, but where they don't actually have their hands on the data. And so they have the ability to, to think a little bit more creatively than a model is ever going to be able to do because it's just limited by you know, the data that's being fed into it and, and the person who wrote the algorithms in the first place. Um, so there's that. Um, but I do think the, the future of the industry, you know, is, is the merger of both. And it's, it's not going to happen quickly because quant managers are tending to come very much from the top down, not always, but a lot of, of quant strategies are coming, you know, looking at massive amounts of data and then filtering down. Fundamental managers, discretionary managers are coming from the bottom up. Um, and these are like two very different ways of, of seeing the world. And so they need to sort of find a common ground um, in order to to become one in the same. They've got to start sort of interbreeding, <laughs> as it were. Speaking of the future, and we were talking about this at the start of the podcast um, in your use of chat GPT, but do you see in the future AI, uh, artificial intelligence, or maybe machine learning or some form of, of, of AI aiding in your process of evaluating managers? Um, yeah, I mean, we're already using machine learning for um, identifying patterns and turning those into, you know, natural language. So you have a tendency to hold on to losing positions when it's raining. It wouldn't be about when it's raining, really. But, you know, when they're, they've, I don't know, they're in a certain sector or when they um, have been... Uh, behaving in a certain way. Those patterns, you can use machine learning, you know, just to cut to the chase and, and get to that much faster than if a human is looking at it. Um, but otherwise, so far, you know, the data that we're dealing is not really big data. You're looking at, you know, how many trades does a, does a discretionary fund manager make over however many years of data that they've got stored it might be it might be thousands it might be it's not going to be millions you know so it, it's hard to apply ai in that way um because it, you know it's just not a big enough data set but i do get very excited about um chat gpt and and uh, generative ai around how you can communicate with the manager you know, so once you've got the system that uh, can do the math, if you had the ability to chat to it and say, I'm thinking about buying this, do you think that's a good idea? And the, the, the bot could come back and say, well, in the past, when you've tended to do this, this is what's happened. That's super easy. Whereas now you, it would take a lot of clicks uh, to come to that conclusion. And so I think there's some exciting uh, future development for us to do in that department. One of the things that I think the asset management sort of business struggles with is this idea of assets versus alpha. So, you know, all asset managers, you know, want to grow assets. Of course, some funds close their funds. If they get too big, they realize, you know, 
they're going to have to adjust their stock picking strategy because I don't know, maybe it's a small cap manager or something. Mm -hmm. But this idea of when, you know, you're a money manager and you're shooting for outperformance and to outperform the market, you got to look different from the market. So that introduces this concept of tracking error. Mm -hmm. And if the strategy falls on bad times for whatever reason, you know, there's a a good possibility that assets are going to leave. And so, you know, what some managers do is they become what is known as closet indexers. They're, they're sort of hugging the index and they're, they're really just trying to never lose a lot. And, but they're probably not going to give themselves a chance for outperformance either. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, do you have any comments or thoughts on that? Given that, you know, you've looked at these successful managers and sort of what they do around the idea of tracking error and trying to limit it and trying to make sure that their investors can stay with them? Yeah, I mean, we see a wide variety of different uh, behaviors around that, you know, some uh, particularly like very large institutions will be more likely to be index hugging um, and have, but then they might be more likely to have captive um, investors too. It just depends where your money's coming from and how sticky it is. So the, the sort of rational approach depends on how flighty the capital is, is likely to be. And it just depends on what type of fund manager you are. Um, but I think uh, that the industry needs to think hard about incentives and how they pay, you know, how managers are getting paid because ultimately managers, they might get a great bonus in a, in a high performance year and everyone's feeling more flush because their great performance has attracted more AUM and, you know, the, the company can afford to pay them a big bonus. But in a bad year, they don't get penalized for that. So for some managers, there will be an incentive to swing for the fences, maybe, um, you know, to really go for it on the tracking error, which, um, you know, isn't, isn't necessarily what the first thought that people have, you know, you think, oh, index huggers are, are the problem. At the end of the day, I think the industry needs to look at the manager's job as decision-making and then judge whether the manager is doing a good job of decision-making and consider whether the manager is trying to improve as a decision-maker and reward the manager accordingly. And regardless of what the one-year performance has been, because one year for most of these managers is, is not a relevant time period. Um, that mismatch, I think, is, is problematic. That, that, that is very interesting. What you, so do you know who Michael Mobison is? Are you familiar with? Of course, yes. Michael? Well, Michael well. Or, okay. Yeah. So he just recently wrote a paper, and he was talking about like uh, using research from a professor from Arizona State, and they, he was looking at like the biggest wealth creators in terms of the stocks that have created the most amount of wealth for investors. And of course, there's, you know, the Apples and the Amazons are on the list, but Berkshire Hathaway's on there. And so, um, and they're pointing out, you know, like 60% of stocks actually don't make money. The other 40% do. And then there's like a small handful, like 2% that make up like a significant portion of that 40%. But I'm wondering, that might be an interesting, and maybe they do track it, like an interesting metric for managers, like overall wealth created mm. that, you know, in, in a fund, I'm thinking of like, I know Morningstar pro produces like investor returns, like the returns investors have gotten in the fund. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know, it would be interesting to, if you could track the overall wealth, because that would effectively tell you, you know, has this manager actually delivered wealth for its investors? Um, it's sort of like, my, and what got me thinking in this track is there's this famous and I don't, I don't think it's a Peter Lynch quote. He's actually on record, I believe, but some people say he said this, that more people lost money in Magellan that, than they made money. But I think Lynch has since come out and said that's not, and Fidelity has come out and said that's not actually true based on the, the data. But it is, we know that investors sort of chase performance of these hot funds and then you know inevitably mm -hmm. that performance goes away and then the average investor loses money. So anyways, that's a long-winded way of just asking you, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm just 
spitballing that idea here of overall wealth creation in funds. And do you know, is that, is that statistic available or? I've never seen that, but I can see why it would be interesting to look at because there's, a, you know, there's so much, it goes back to this point about, you know, alpha is one thing, but AUM is another. And, you know, just because your performance was good when you had 10 million under management doesn't mean it's going to be good when you have 10 billion under management. And, you know, for the manager, um, that's a problem. And that's, that's something that they have to navigate. So if they had, if they had that overall wealth measure in mind, that was a function of, of the total assets that they're managing. Um, yeah, that would probably be a, a, a better way of looking at it. If the, you know, if their mission is to deliver wealth for clients. Um, if you could give your average investor sort of a key insight on evaluating, I mean, you do this for a profession. You've built a company around this. You obviously have the software and tools. Um, you know, and we have a very wide range of investors that watch this podcast. We have professionals that wa watch it. We have retail investors. But you know, w for your average investor out there, someone that's buying mutual funds in their 401k plan, or maybe their brokerage account, or or strat or ETFs or or investment strategies, there's a lot of different ways that you know people managers can deploy these strategies. Um, what would be what would be like the key insight you would tell someone? Well, so ultimately, the insight is that. You should be judging a manager on the quality of their decision making, not on their recent performance. And if you don't have access to, to that information, th that's going to be hard to do. Uh, but you should demand access to that information because they, the manager has it. And the allocator, maybe you're, if you're a retail investor, you're a, um, if you're a, an investor that's going through a uh, OCIO or, you know, an outsource, a third party who is maybe allocating to separately managed accounts or segregated accounts, they will have access to the data that they need to do that, that analysis. And that can help you stop chasing recent performance. That's, you know, the thing that all investors need to wrap their heads around. Stop with the chasing recent performance. Here's something that you can do that, that is going to be a better measure um, but if you're, and, and you could do the same analysis on ETFs and, you know, passive fund, it's not going to really be that useful because they're not rebalancing that often. But, um, if you're looking at, I mean, an index fund, um, but if you're looking at active funds, if you're an institutional investor, the number one question I would be asking is the same number one question that I'm asking anytime we hire anybody at Essentia Analytics, is this person a continuous improver? And what proof do we have of that? Because I think that people who are not continuous improvers, like by nature, are at a huge disadvantage in life. <laughs> and in, it's only going to get harder in the future because, you know, the world is iterating faster and faster. And if you're not able to embrace that, you're going to have a problem and uh, yeah, not everybody is. So even just asking that question, you know, what evidence do you have of your efforts to continuously improve? Talk to me about that is something I think all institutional asset allocators should be asking. Thank you for all your time today. This is, this has been really informative. Um, as we wrap up the podcast, we always ask a standard closing question to everyone. And that question is based on your experience in the markets. If you could impart piece, one piece of wisdom or teach one lesson to the average investor, what would it be? It would be to know thyself. <laughs> it would be to don't be afraid to look in the mirror. You know, it's very easy to point the finger at other people and criticize other people's behavior. But the only person's behavior that you can control is your own. So therefore... You need to look in the mirror with actual data coming out, you know, and, and be honest with yourself about what's working and what's not working. That's a scary thing for a lot of people. And nobody's necessarily, well, some people are very motivated to do it, but the average person is not. And I think that um, an investor who wants to succeed has to do that. Claire, thank you very much for joining us today. I think anyone watching uh, this episode 
will hopefully uh, be in that continuous improvement group. So really appreciate all your thoughts and knowledge. Thanks so much. Thank you. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.